Hello, uh, this is Rajiv Nalawadi, and uh, welcome to Life's Magical Journeys YouTube channel. So today we'll be talking about uh, Haruki Murakami. And uh, I have talked about uh, Murakami in one of my earlier videos and also reviewed one of his, uh, one of his novel. So today I will start off, uh, he's a Japanese author. So for people who have not viewed the other uh, video do go and view that as well. I've, I've, I've covered three Japanese novelists there, uh, Haruki Murakami, Kikuhiko Shino, and Natsume Sosoki. So uh, one of the novel of uh, Murakami was reviewed there. So Murakami was born in 1949 in Kyoto, Japan, and uh, growing up in post-war Japan, and uh, he was deeply influenced by the Western culture, so particularly by the music, talks a lot about the Beatles music, and uh, his path to becoming an author, it went through him studying drama at Waseda University in Tokyo, where he met his wife, Yoko, and they opened a jazz bar called Peter Cat, and, uh, which he ran through his uh, 20s. And then that experience of jazz bar ownership uh, and his passion for music, it's profoundly formed in all of his, all of his works and his novels. And it's uh, uh, sort of his writing style as well, which is unique. Uh, and as Murakami's journey began uh, with writing uh, when he was attending a baseball game in 1978, and he had a sudden epiphany to write a novel, and uh, he wrote the first one called Here the Wind Sing, and that's his first uh, novel. So today we will be talking about uh, a few of his uh, novels, and this one I'll start off with the memoir. Uh, what I talk about when I talk about running, this is uh, like Murakami in his own uh, unique style explaining uh, the act of running and uh, what it means to him. And uh, really like it's a sort of uh, an intertwined nature, he says, when it comes to writing and running. And uh, he compares how both of the disciplines have shaped his life overall. And he provides a unique glimpse. Uh, and, and this is the time you get. You know, this is a memoir you should read uh, if you are a Murakami fan. Uh, uh, it provides a unique glimpse into his personal philosophy and uh, how he approaches creativity and education to long distance running. And he started running in his early 30s. So after he became a writer, right? So, uh, and around the time he sold his uh, jazz bar to become a full-time writer. So he draws a lot of parallels between running and writing. Uh, there's a lot of discipline that is required and endurance that is uh, that is really, really needed. And uh, it's also both the acts of running and writing uh, are a solitude kind of activity. And it, it's a need that solitude is a need for both running as well as uh, writing so for murakami running became sort of a metaphor for the creative uh, and the solitary endeavor of uh, writing the novels you're al always sort of alone sitting in some corner of your home or in some place right in, if when you're writing so that that is uh, that is uh, reflected in this uh, memoir, and uh, the narrative weaves through the various marathons and triathlons that Murakami has participated. Um, they span from Greece to New York City, and uh, he's an amazing <laughs> on runner and a triathlon athlete, right? So an endurance athlete. So when he talks about endurance, he knows what he is talking about. Uh, as to that, uh, so it requires a lot of. Uh, a lot of perseverance and endurance to stick to either one of the activities, be it running, long distance running, or or writing. So kind of these experiences, he explores the theme of aging, health, and the constant challenge that you are put on to uh, for pushing through one's limits. And uh, that, that comes out very clearly in this particular memoir. So 
uh, physical and mental challenges uh, that you have with long distance running and uh, how these experiences inform the work and the life philosophy and personally for me i have done about 10 marathons uh, the california international marathon and i personally uh, like relate in my mind the mental challenges and the physical challenges for me personally it is around mile 18 and mile 18 in the California International Marathon is also when they uh, provide and I'm not the fastest runner so I I anyway have my beer and after that the next uh, eight miles are the toughest so it says just give up just give up and uh, uh, but still just keep on pushing one feet next to the other so you keep on going and you hit that 26 point two mile mark of the marathon so uh, uh, I think uh, these experiences uh, like kind of teach you how to have that endurance and that uh, personal endurance is required both in running and in life so uh, Murakami says it has taught him to deal with defeat and disappointment and uh, sort of it reinforces the persistence and resilience that reflects in his in his writing so it's uh, a memoir not just about running it's about the discipline uh, of running and the discipline that is required in writing and in life overall in order for any person to be successful so it is uh, truly meditative, <laughs> just like all his novels, you just immerse yourself into, into his novels, right? So just like you know, his novels, it is truly meditative and introspective, and it is filled with personal anecdotes and reflections. Uh, it provides you like uh, some glimpse into Murakami's uh, psyche, and uh, that's what I loved about it. And it's a book that resonates not only with uh, runners, but uh, sort of aspiring writers, uh, what it means uh, to have self-improvement in your life, and also the pursuit of uh, passion. What does it mean to pursue your passion? That's what you'll get out of this, uh, this particular uh, book from Murakami. So uh, overall, he doesn't provide you with any grandiose conclusions about life or writing, right? So although he shares his personal journey, uh, that sort of invites the readers to ponder and think about uh, how to find their own paths and how to find their own happiness. And uh, overall, happiness uh, is a very subjective thing right of every person. And everybody wants to be happy. So ultimately, how to achieve that happiness through discipline, endurance, and a commitment to the passions. So that is very critical. Your commitment to the passions is what brings you happiness. So. That's what I personally got out of his uh, memoir. So uh, wonderful, wonderful read. So if you have not yet gotten to uh, Murakami, do read one novel and come back to this. Or start with this and then go to the other novel. Uh, that's, how, that's what I would recommend. So the first uh, novel, uh, or the second one that we'll be reviewing today in today's video, is 1Q84. So it's uh, it's sort of uh, one and a question question mark right of eighty four. So it uh, stands for nineteen eighty four uh, in the way you would put that in uh, in Japanese, right? So uh, nineteen eighty four was also a George Orwell novel which came in nineteen forty nine, right? But there is no uh, correlation to between George Orwell's nineteen eighty four and Murakami's. 1Q84, they are both unique in themselves. And uh, uh, George Orwell's 1984, let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, it talked about, it was released in 1949, but it talked about how the world will look like in 1984. And he coined the terms Big Brother and all that. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll bring George Orwell's uh, novels here in one of the future videos. But for now, we'll continue with uh, Murakami. So 1Q84, the story unfolds in Tokyo during the year 1984. And it follows two main characters, uh, Ayumane and uh, Tengu. Ayomane is a fitness instructor uh, who spends a lot of time exercising to keep herself in, in pretty good shape. And uh, 
she's also moonlighting as a part-time assassin and uh, her main uh, goal is to target men who abuse women <laughs> right so so that's uh, ayomane's you know, passion and sort of uh, when uh, when uh, she's going on with her life and uh, when ayomane is stuck in in a traffic jam on a tokyo expressway uh, she climbs down some emergency staircase and it leads her into this parallel uh, reality which uh, she dubs as 1Q84, questioning whether it's 84, <laughs> 1984. And she notices a subtle difference there, and uh, such as two moons in the sky. And uh, the second person or the second character here is Tengo. And he's a math teacher and also aspiring to be a novelist. Uh, but he becomes involved in this uh, dubious literary project. Uh, rewriting of a peculiar uh, manuscript it, and it and the title of that manuscript is air chrysalis and it was written by a mysterious teenage girl uh, fukayeri uh, some time ago right so fukayeri is a mysterious teenage girl who wrote this novel air chrysalis and it plays a pivotal role in this whole story so Fukayeri is an enigmatic and a complex character and sort of an otherworldly presence, right? So uh, the way you read uh, Murakami's novels is you completely immerse yourself in that world, right? So you shouldn't leave, uh, uh, you shouldn't be judging along as you go along and read uh, his novel. Most people, uh, they sort of are disappointed when they pick up a Murakami book, uh, be it this one or any other one, right? Uh, and they go through a few chapters and they say, oh, I don't understand this world uh, of Murakami, the way he is writing. But you have to immerse yourself in Murakami, uh, Murakami's world. And that's when that that's when you start really really enjoying his his novels. It's dystopian fiction, right? Uh, dystopian fiction because he's taking you into a different other world and other reality and so on. Think of it as a multiverse. <laughs> so that's how I would uh, approach reading uh, Murakami's novels. So the lives of Ayomane and Tenko gradually converge as the novel progresses. And the novel is made into three parts, right? Like, uh, so you can call it as book one, two, three. And uh, it is split uh, with three months. Uh, within that year, 1984, but starts in April, so the first three months uh, are not there. So uh, it it sort of uh, when Ayomane and Tengo uh, form a deep connection that transcends the boundaries of the two worlds. So they also find themselves in a complex conflict that involves a religious cult uh, and the enigmatic little people. Uh, who emerged from the manuscript Air Chrysalis. And that's where this novel uh, or a manuscript Air Chrysalis has a pivotal role in this whole in this whole narrative. And uh, the competing forces that seek to control the fate of both worlds, right? So they are living these two worlds and the two moons are, are a metaphor for that. So Murakami is weaving together elements of fantasy, science fiction, and thriller. Uh, and he's drawing on his own knowledge of uh, uh, the history, uh, literature, and music. So uh, there is a lot of historical things which uh, Murakami has also uh, written. So I will, I will bring those about in another video, separate video. So the novel's exploration of an alternate reality, it serves as a vehicle for Murakami. So he's diving into the uh, philosophical questions about the nature of existence. And uh, it's all about the subjective experience of reality. And uh, all we have uh, uh, is subjective experience of the reality, right? Whatever reality uh, we perceive. Uh, and it changes based on every individual's experience. So that's the parallel world of 1Q84 with its two moons and the mysterious little people. It sort of is a mirror uh, reflecting the character's innermost desires. Uh, uh, what are the fears? What is the unyielding quest for truth and connection that we are all striving for in this world? So uh, it's a rich uh, tapestry that 
uh, is weaved together and uh, it deals with love, loneliness and then the nature of reality and also shows the power of storytelling and storytelling by Murakami and also uh, of this manuscript, what happens in there and so on. So do go ahead and read uh, and uh, complete Murakami <laughs> novel. You'll be emotionally satisfied and you will love and uh, enjoy it and you'll become a Murakami fan uh, in, in no time after you complete one of his novels. So the other novel uh, we'll be discussing here today is Kafka on the Shore. Uh, Kafka on the Shore is also, uh, I have a lot of friends who say, probably they did not even complete it. They started and then put the book away, right? So, but I I would encourage anybody to go back and read it. So uh, there are a couple of narratives in this, uh, in this novel. The first uh, narrative thread follows a 15 year old boy who calls himself Kafka Tamura, right? And uh, he is uh, seeking to escape an Oedipal curse. You know what Oedipus is, and uh, Oedipus is basically uh, where where a son kills a father to make love to a mother. Right. So that's the Oedipal curse. But but uh, it's a different troubled relationship. Also, he's dealing with his with his father. So Kafka, the young Kafka, runs away from home. And a few chapters in the beginning, uh, it's all about that thought process of how Kafka plans to uh, plans to run away from the home. So the journey takes him to Takamatsu, where he's seeking sort of a shelter in a private. Uh, library that is run by uh, the enigmatic uh, Miss Seki and uh, the very kind Oshima. And as Kafka continues to confront with his uh, inner turmoil, uh, it sort of becomes a metaphysical quest and uh, for his mother and sister. So, um, and that's when uh, he's trying to attempt to untangle his complicated family history to find his own identity. Right, and parallel to Kafka's story, the second narrative itself is the tale of Satoru Nakata. He's an aging but a simple minded man who lost his ability to read, uh, but he retains uh, no memory of his past after a mysterious uh, incident during his, uh, during his childhood. So Nakata, all, uh, although gained this remarkable ability to communicate with cats. So there is always cats and there are cats in a lot of Japanese novels. The Japanese novelists, they love cats. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, the, this uh, Murakami is known for cats, <laughs> uh, bringing up cats. Yeah. Uh, so Nakata's serene and unassuming life, it's turned upside down. Uh, when he becomes uh, embroiled in a modern, uh, that prompts him to leave his home and then embark on a journey. Uh, it kind of uh, intertwines with uh, Kafka's own quest. So there is a lot of uh, blend of natural, supernatural elements along with everyday life. Uh, there is, of course, talking cats, uh, fish raining from the sky, and spirits in the narrative. So these are all the dystopian fiction world, right, that Murakami is creating. You need to just immerse yourself in that world and go for a ride. And that's when you'll start enjoying uh, Murakami. It takes you out of your own world you know, to step into his world. And that's, uh, that's what you'll enjoy when you read Murakami's novels. The novel is uh, steeped in references to Western literature and uh, music, and particularly uh, Murakami himself loves Beatles music as well. And uh, he is uh, sort of invoking the spirit of Franz Kafka. And Franz Kafka was a Zek novelist, right? And uh, his themes of alienation, guilt, and existential angst, uh, they resonate deeply within the story. So uh, Kafka has this famous quote, right? If you can recall correctly, whoever is trying to find himself, doesn't find himself. But whoever doesn't try to find himself is bound to be found, right? So that's Kafka's, uh, one of the Kafka's quotes. So the novel is structured around the themes of memory, the destiny, and the overall subconscious, uh, exploring the complex interplay of fate and free will. Right, and then the novel 
dives into the depths of human psyche uh, and examining the shadows lingering in the heart and uh, the invisible threads we all have in the life. Uh, the storytelling is dreamlike and grounded. So it creates a surreal experience and a surreal world, a dystopian fiction world, uh, where there are fantastical elements that feel as real as the character's emotional journey. So you're on an emotional journey of these two characters. And, uh, and that's where uh, an immersive experience is required. So uh, it explores the pain of isolation, the quest of self-discovery, and, uh, and and sort of the mysterious uh, realms that shape all our lives, essentially. So that's, uh, uh, that's like other Murakami novels uh, out here, wonderful, wonderful novels that I will be bringing in a future uh, video. There is Colorless Sukuru Kazaki, a wonderful read, I would say, Sputnik Sweetheart, and then After Dark, and uh, Murakami's Norwegian book. I have reviewed this one in another video, so do go ahead and watch that if you love uh, Murakami. And then Hard Boiled uh, Egg, and then Wonderland, and The End of the World is a wonderful read as well. Uh, the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. And uh, uh, south of the border, west of the sun, and a wild sheep chase, men without women. These are all wonderful, wonderful Murakami novels, and I'll be bringing them in a future video. So do go ahead and subscribe to Life's Magical Journeys, so you'll stay in touch whenever I put up new videos. Uh, and do subscribe to the other socials, Facebook, Insta, and LinkedIn. And uh, that's it for today, and uh, see you all next time with another novelist and some of their uh, novels. Thank you, bye.